Welcome back to the Fuel Your Legacy podcast. Each week, we expose the faulty foundational mindsets of the past and rebuild a newer, stronger foundation essential in creating your meaningful legacy. We've got a lot of work to do, so let's get started. As much as you like this podcast, I'm certain that you're going to love the book that I just released on Amazon, Fuel Your Legacy, The Nine Pillars to Build a Meaningful Legacy. I wrote this to share with you the experiences that I had while I was identifying my identity, how I began to create my meaningful legacy, and how you can create yours. You're going to find this book on Kindle, Amazon, and as always on my website, samnickerbocker.com. Welcome back to the Fuel Your Legacy show, and I've got a phenomenal guest on here, Keaton Nelson. He actually reached out to me after hearing me on another podcast and wanted to know a little bit more about legacy or how I viewed legacy. And we had such a good conversation. I was like, man, I don't want the conversation to end on his podcast. So we're bringing it on to our podcast to continue the conversation, but also learn more about why he does what he does. He's now the owner and creator of Perpetual Motion Marketing. And so I'm going to let him define and describe a little bit more about what that is. But I think uh, what he's sharing... You may be a business owner. You may think, oh, why do I need a personal brand or why do I need to be marketing myself in general? The statistics are crazy. Okay. Statistically, over, <laughs> this is crazy, 30% of people are more likely to date somebody with a personal brand. Okay. You might think, well, why does personal brand matter? Because people trust you more. They, they don't want to get catfished. It doesn't matter what industry you're in, if you're going to be watching their children down the street or whatever, having a personal brand matters. Um, 61% of people said they're more likely to go to a doctor with a personal brand than just any doctor. You might think, well, I just work at the hospital. Why do I need a personal brand? Because people care about it, right? They want to know that you are who you are. And so part of that, having a good brand, is actually knowing how to you know, perpetually get your, yourself out there in a way that people can know, get to know, like, and trust you. And that's what Keaton's fantastic about. And that's, it aligns great with my mission of legacy because you can live a great life, but if you don't live a great life and have people know that you're living a great life, then what impact is it having? So, um, I mean, there's a lot that I'm bringing in from his show and he'll be able to tell you when that airs and you know, all that, but we're excited to have this conversation. Go for us Keaton, and tell us where you started a little bit of your childhood, how you got to where you are and why you're so passionate about it today. Oh man. Well, thanks for the great intro. First of all, that was awesome, dude. Um, I'm excited to be here. We had an awesome time um, having you on my podcast and you're right. I just want to continue the conversation and uh, get to, you know, get my story out there to, to your listeners too. Um, I he said, start with my childhood, right? Before this, you wanted to say, start early, okay? So I was born in New Mexico. I moved to Virginia by the time I was two. So I don't remember thinking about that. But I moved with my mother, who's a single mother, and um, to be around our family, which was my closest sibling, who's 17 years older than I am. Right, she and wow. she's my closest sibling to me. I have a brother who's 19 years older than me, and a sister she's like probably 22 or 23 years older than me. So, with that being said, um, definitely not an ordinary, you know, <laughs> childhood for sure. I was like an only child, but I had these older siblings. Right, um, grew up in Virginia to about fifth grade. I moved around a lot in Virginia, so I was going around, bounced around from school to school, and always being the new kid. That allowed me to, you know, get to know people, make friends, uh, a lot of life skills that most people who have been in the same school system forever and have the same friends do not have. I'm not saying it's good or bad, but I, it was a huge skill for me as I grew up and I look back on. And then um, my sister, who we were, you know, closest with in Virginia, she got married to a guy who's from Rhode Island. So we moved in the fifth grade to go hang out with them because uh, my mom wanted to be around the the grandkids to come. Right? Um, definitely tired of moving at this point. Probably moved five, six times already in Virginia. I'm like, I'm done with this. I'm going to fifth grade. But um, I was in that school system for a little bit. And then, you know, teenage years, middle school, get into a little bit of trouble. Um, <laughs> riding around on bikes, smoking weed and stuff. And then 
we end up moving one last time to West Warwick. And what was wild is West Warwick had this crazy music program. Like you go and compete at like international festivals and things like that. And they won. And I was just learning how to play guitar. And I got really, really, really good at it. And um, ended up winning awards and all uh, that type of stuff. And I got excited. And I was applying to music schools. So I ended up going to school for music and I love jazz, jazz composition. And and that's what I went to school for. And while I was in school, I, uh, I I fell in love with a girl and we had a kid very shortly after we met. So I met in October. Um, We were friends for a few months and I had to win her over, start dating and stuff. Uh, by January, we were dating, and then by May, she was pregnant. Wild, right? Nice. I was like fifty thousand dollars in debt, working at Subway at University of Rhode Island, making some sandwiches, and then I um, <laughs> I realized that finishing school for music and trying to work at Subway was not going to be a, be a way that I could support my family, right? So I started dabbling with the idea of like, you know, first of all, I was like, how can I just have a place to stay and live? And I I ended up waiting tables. For those of you who don't know, you can actually make pretty decent money waiting tables, easily make 50 to 100 grand a year, uh, depending on where you work. But man, that is not a fun life to live, Uh, especially when you're, you're trying to be a responsible adult. I think it might be a great life to live if you're just being a kid and enjoying it. But I wanted more. For my family. So I started, you know, drop shipping. I started like all these online businesses and, and like trying to, you know, play around with entrepreneurship. And I'd dabble in it and then I'd go three steps further and I'd find a challenge and I'd quit. Right. Or I'd run out of money to spend on ads or this. I wouldn't try and figure out how to solve the problem. I'd just accept failure and quit. Um, and then I, I was just waiting tables and and then I went to a Super Bowl party. Or a Super Bowl party sitting around with my my father-in-law and his friends and this guy sitting next to me, he's like talk, talking to me about how he's a real estate agent. And he's like, "Look, dude, I can uh I can make 3% on this $500,000 house." I was like, "3%? That's $15,000, you know? Like how many of those can you sell?" He's like, I don't know, like 10, 10 a month. I go, what? <laughs> Which, by the way, exaggerations here and everything. Uh-huh. But I was fired up. Like two months later, I was in like the accelerator program. I got my license, my real estate license. And I was trying to go and sell real estate. Dude, I tried it for about six months before I got my first sale. It was a $70,000 condo. And I think I got like two and a half percent. You know, and then... In, you pay your broker. They don't tell you all this stuff. You have to pay half of it to your broker. You got to do this, this, and this. And the next thing you know, you paid for your license. You paid for your dues. I think I was left with like 20 bucks. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> really, it wasn't, wasn't a lot of money. And, um, and you know, I, I stayed with it, though, a lot longer than I did with all those other businesses. And I got to a point where I was about to close on three pretty large houses. This ended up, it, was gonna, it was a week away. All of them had three closings lined up in a week. And I was about to make more money in a week than I had made in an entire year ever. I was like, this is it, guys. This is amazing. You know, I worked really, really hard up to this point. I showed like 70 houses to this one client who's selling and buying a house. And then this other person I showed about 15 houses to. And we were ready to do it. I took it all the way through. And then the seller decided that she didn't want to buy this house anymore. I was like, okay, we can go find another house. And then she's like, I don't want to sell my house. And we had it under contract. Boom. Two deals gone. And I had nothing. It was all out of my control. Right. The financing fell through on the third deal. And I lost all of it in the same week. I, at that moment, I gave up. And I went back to waiting tables and I said, I'll just become a manager at Red Robin. Make $55,000 a year, get my three weeks of, eight, of paid vacation, and maybe I'll have some, bon- uh, some benefits. So 
I did my shift supervisor training. I was starting to apply for management positions and I turned 26 and I really just took a look at myself and said, is this what I want to do? Is this what I really, really want to do with my life? Do I want to spend the next like 10 years going in and working 12 hour days managing people that I, you know, it just was not going to, everything about it, I didn't want to do. I didn't really want to do. I was just doing it because I thought I was being responsible. Right. And then I said, you know what? I need a way to pay off this debt. I need something that's going to actually give my family um, a life that I want to give them. Right. I, like I wanted more than just a, a crappy rundown two bedroom apartment with drunks and drug addicts next door and stuff, because that's all we could afford. You know what I mean? Um, and I prayed. I didn't have an answer. I, I, I was like, God, if you just give me an answer, if you just give me an idea, a business, whatever it happens to be, an idea that will allow me to give me give the life I want to to my family and pay off that debt. I promise I won't quit. If you give me a natural answer that I think will work, I won't quit like I've done on everything else. And I prayed and I prayed. I prayed multiple times a day. So please, please give me an idea. Give me an idea. Went for three days. This is where I was at, right? I I still smoke cigarettes at this time, right? I was outside on my back porch smoking a cigarette, and the idea hit me like that. When I did real estate, the only way I got leads was from posting on social media because I couldn't afford to buy leads on Zillow or Realtor.com or market in any other way, but I could post on social media. And I got people who was like, hey, my aunt wants to buy or sell and stuff, but that's how I got my leads. And... I was like, I bet people will pay me to do that. I bet people will pay me to do that. I'm like, how much could I charge? And I started playing with it. I was like, God, this idea works. I like threw my cigarette out halfway through, which is like back then I never did. I had to suck it down to the filter, right? Um, I ran inside. I started writing out how I wanted to do it. Um, and then it's funny what happens when, when you make a decision like this. What I now know is a terror barrier kicks in. You have an idea, you make a decision, you're going to go after it, and then all the thoughts come in as to why it's not going to work. You might even run into people and tell you, they'll tell you why your idea is not going to work. And you just have to push through that. I didn't know that's what I was doing at the time, but that's what I was doing. I was like, you know, why would anyone pay me to do this? You know, they won't do it. I can't charge enough money. Like, they won't want to afford, you know, no one wants to invest in you to do this. Those are the thoughts that are going through my head. You know, it's like your 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 own self critic, it's your self saboteur. You know, cranking through your head. And um, I went to I went to a Mexican restaurant down the street. Is that a he had, this guy who owned it? He was young. He was like my age. I was like I was twenty six. I think he might have been like twenty five or twenty four. Like man, how did you get this business? Whatever. And he he told me his story, and he goes. He goes, you, you tell me the story. And I go, dude, I've been thinking about this business idea. And I tell him I wanted to you know, manage people's social media. His reaction was crazy. He goes, dude, if I wasn't doing this restaurant, that's what I would do. It's brilliant. Everyone needs it. You've got to do it. So I went home and I went on Canva and I designed this thing saying I would manage people's social media. And I, I, I called a print shop. I was like, how much to print out this? And I was like... Like 30, 50, how many flyers can I get? I looked at my bank account. I had $32 in my bank account. I'm not even joking. I had $32 in my bank account. Okay. I spent $27 on like, it was like between 40 and 50 flyers. Was wild. It didn't even fit on the page. It had like a white rim around it. And I, I was like, I can't go hand this out. It's not going to look professional. So I went home. And I sat by the TV. My daughter was watching Moana. And I sat there so carefully for about two and a half hours, cutting off this little sliver of paper, really meticulously so it didn't look all like jagged and stuff. 
And then I didn't even go and pass them out. I didn't go and pass them out for like two weeks because more of those thoughts came in my head. I went and did all that. and spent the last bit of my money at like $4 in my bank account. I still didn't go and do it. And then I talked to someone else and they, they're like, you should do it. And they're like, it's a great idea. Just give it a shot. And I said, you know what? If I go and do it and no one calls me or I don't get any sales, at least I know that I did it and I gave it a shot. So I went and did it. It was a cold day in February in New England. It was like raining. I remember it was sprinkling. I went to like sandwich shops, pizza shops, barbers, CBD stores, you, you like, you know, dance studios, every, like all these local businesses, right? And everyone's like, nope, 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 screw you. And my pitch was like, I wasn't was in there. I was like, hey, I'll manage your social media. And if you decide to do it today, you can give me a call back before the end of today. I'll do your first month for free. A couple days go by. And um, I remember I was picking up my, my daughter from my, my mom's house because she watched her and stuff on some days. And I, I had a phone call come in. The phone rang and it was like an out of state number. And I was like, it's probably a bill collector or it's probably like, you know, those scam calls or what I was like, ignored it. And then I saw a voicemail was that I was like, Oh, that doesn't normally happen. I checked the voicemail and this guy who owns some CBD stores. Like, Hey, my manager said you came into my store the other day and you do social media. Can you give me a call back? Mind you, I'm picking up my daughter at like six, seven o'clock at night. I'm trying to bring her home. It's freezing out. It's March in New England or, or Feb- it's still February. Probably snowing. It's freezing, like lower than 20 degrees, right? I bring her, my daughter down to the car. I turn on the car, turn up the, the heat. And I'm standing outside in the cold because I'm afraid my daughter's going to be like yelling while I'm on the phone. And I'm like, hey, yeah. And I asked him, like, well, you know, he had someone that was already doing social media. Told me what he was charging. And I said, what, what, like, what don't you like about what he's doing? And why are you thinking about switching? And I said, I'll do all of those things and what he's doing. And I'll charge you $200 less. And he had four CBD stores, and I signed up four CBD stores that week. So my first month, I did such a good job and did what I said I was going to do that he referred me to about five to ten people, and he signed up. He had multiple businesses, signed up to some more businesses. I think I made like $2,500 my first month in business, and I was waiting tables at the time. I was like, I'm on top of the world. This is amazing. And it slowly snowballed from there. And now we're doing 50 to 100K a month. I've got a team of, well, we've got a team of five in the in states and we got a lot of people overseas and we work with a lot of contractors, but I pay about 20 people every week. And um, I travel about once a month. I get to bring my family. I've bought my mom a car. I've, I've got to do everything that God promised I would do if I stuck with it. And I'll tell you what, I left out a lot of pieces of that story where I did want to quit because business isn't easy, but I, I stuck with it. I remember crying 2 a.m. like waking up 3 a.m. Couldn't get back to sleep, stressed, went through all that. Um, but it paid off. Freaking love it, man. Thank you so much for sharing your story. I, I'm going to like <laughs> dig into some of this uh, information. I think it's just like it, it, it speaks to the different mindset of somebody and the different areas of our lives. Because what, what I like about hearing somebody's journey from the beginning to the and I say end, meaning current, because um, it's not over. That's the cool thing. It's not over. But when you hear that. You're, you're hearing the full transformation and you're hearing it often from a perspective of it already worked out, you know? So it's cool. It's fun to talk about because they're already working it out. But when you're in the midst of it, I just listened to a podcast by Ed Milet and this comedian, uh, Christina, Christina P. And they were talking about how we need to, like, you can only be as funny as you are comfortable with the darkness of your life. 
right? The more comfortable you are with the darkness, the more funny you are on stage because you're okay. You, you've explored the darkness. And my wife and I have talked about this before with our own kids. Like, how do we help our kids, uh, uh, like, allow them to feel their emotions as, like, three- and five-year-olds, but also still get them to do what we need them to do? Because at some point, like, we're the parents and we're the adults and they still have to, like, not run out in the road. They still have to do certain things for survival reasons. And so their feelings, although they're important, they are often superseded by, like, the known facts that an adult knows, right? We know you don't go run in front of a car. Well, why? Well, because we want you to be around. But to a five-year-old, they don't understand that necessarily. So, like, how do you, when they're pissed at me and when they're in the darkest of their moments, how are we recording the darkest of their moments <laughs> in their words so that when they're older, we can say, hey, look, you used to feel this way. This is, this is like direct, you told us this, okay? And so... My epiphany today as I was listening to this is next time my sons are in this like whirl of emotion, which is probably going to be later today because it's all like constant. Okay. (laughs) Especially one of them, very emotional, love them to death. But instead of like getting upset, because that's normally what happens. My temper is fairly short sometimes, but like, I'm just going to turn on the voice detection on my phone, you know, and just, Hey, how are you feeling? Why do you feel this way? And start interviewing him and letting him like, oh, I hate you. I want you to die. I want to die. Whatever, right? We all feel these things. Like it's normal to feel a wide range of emotions. And as we're growing up, we get trained that feeling all these emotions is actually not okay. Mm-hmm. When in reality, maybe feeling all those emotions, if we really understood them, could help the next person on their journey. Okay. And so that's what I love about your story and you sharing some of those details with us of like, look, this sucked. And then this happened and then I got all of it done and then it still sucked. So let's talk about this a little bit. So single mom, you're two years old. And I, some people will say, well, two years old is too, too young to really know what's going on. I think, well, I know I have memories from when I was two years old. So like, I know that if not specific memories, there's still feelings and stuff. And even if it wasn't two years old, it's like three, four, five. So it's still formative years. Like most of this, I studied neuropsychology in college, and the the the, uh, the main idea there is that your brain's actually like a lot of your programming is done by the age of eight. Yes. By the age of eight, you've decided who you're going to be and a lot of stuff about life. From age of eight to twenty five, before your brain is like fully developed, and I'm, if you're not watching this, I'm saying that in quotations, is actually a search for evidence of who you believe you are or what you were trained to be from zero to eight. So from eight to 25 is evidence gathering to reinforce your identity from zero to eight, which is crazy to think to your child. You might think, Oh, it doesn't matter if I'm with them when they're young, when they're older, they're going to remember. No, what from zero to eight is like, that's their formative years. And then eight to 25 also formative because that's where they're gathering, gathering all of their evidence for their beliefs about their identity from zero to eight. So both sides are very important. So when you say single mom, that's a a very easy way, I would say, to gloss over maybe more pain. Like, how did she become a single mom? Why is she a single mom? Why are you the 17 years away from your youngest sibling? Like, that doesn't just happen generally. (laughs) Some some things that lead up to this massive gap and a, a mother becoming a single mom, whether that's there was no marriage and there was a, a an unfortunate circumstance or whatever. So I'm curious, yeah. dig into a little bit more of the emotion there about like, how did that come to be? And what was the energy that you felt from your mom about that circumstance that she was in? Mm, yeah. Interesting. So I love that you, you push it. This is cool. So uh-huh. I didn't know how far you wanted to go when in that. So this is We're going. I, I want the deets. I want to, yeah, know. this is good. I, um, I vaguely remember the car ride. And by the way, like this is back in the early nineties, mid nineties, where like, like I was like sitting in the front seat without a no, no seat car seat, no seat seat belt. you know what I mean? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. exactly. Two years old. Um, so I vaguely remember that. And, um, I, I didn't really grasp much. Yeah. Let me take this back. So I don't know how my mother felt. I don't. I have no idea what she felt like during this time. I can imagine now as an adult how it must have been and, and be freaky. 
here's a story of where she came from. She uh, got pregnant 17 years old and then with someone that she didn't stay with. Then she had two kids with someone she married around 22 years old who was abusive to both the kids and her. Then she took $20 in her sock and rode a bus to uh, Seattle with three kids by herself. And then I know I'm kind of like glossing over it, but there's a kind of a lot that happened. I want to be able to get it all in there. Right. Um, She ended up in New Mexico when they were, you know, graduating high school and she had actually sent them off to live with their fathers at that point because my mother was going through things emotionally. Uh, Then she met my father in New Mexico who already had a seven, 16 year old daughter was, did not want another kid. Right. So she knew that he didn't want the kid. He probably saw me once or twice within those two years. And she didn't want me to grow up around that disappointment. So she moved me to live with closer to my siblings. So, so in that, in that situation, did, would, would you say, and again, this is all probably hindsight and hearing so from, but like, even though she, he didn't want that, do you feel like over that two year period of time, did she still love him? Did he still love her? Or was, just, or was it like the moment she got pregnant, it was like, you betrayed me because you knew I didn't want another kid. And I wrote you off as a human, but I have some obligation to you sort of. So he wanted an abortion and she wouldn't do it. I think she was also on birth control when they when I got pregnant when she got pregnant with me. Uh but she from my understanding is that they had like a fun relationship for about a year and this happened accidentally. You know what I mean? Okay. Uh so I don't know it, it wasn't as like doesn't sound super serious, you know? Uh yeah. but my mother was 38 at the time. And and I think my father is around the same age. So I don't know if that answers your question. No, that's good. No, that's good. So she chooses. I, I, a lot of this is like if you're a parent, if you're listening to this as a parent or maybe a business owner, you have to make decisions that seem crazy that for the betterment of the people around you, even if it's not your ideal situation, right? So sure. sending her three children to live with their dads probably wasn't the most ideal situation. There was a reason that she wasn't still with those people. You know, it's mm-hmm. not like she just accidentally found herself in Seattle. She left them for a reason. And then because of life circumstances, what was best at that point and what's best doesn't mean it's the best situation. It's what's best now, you know, <laughs> what makes sense now. The best could still be a really crappy deal. You know, the best deal could still be a really crappy deal. So she sends those kids off, gets pregnant again. And then because she wanted to protect or, or create a healthy-ish environment for Keaton, she moves across the country again. But when you move across the country, this is, this is a funny thing. Like, you have to start over everything. What did she do for work when she got there? What did she do for housing? Yeah. So it lives with my sister, who was, mind you, very young. She was probably 19 years old, right? Yeah, think of like the humility of the parent who has to say, look, my life has not worked out so far. I'm now moving in with my 19-year-old child because they're more stable than I am. Mm-hmm. Like that, yeah. I just think of like the amount of sacrifice a parent goes through to provide the best situation for their child, even though they're, they're making the best out of a bad situation, is incredible. And not only in that light, but also... As a business owner, like I'm trying to, I like to think of this in both ways because this is my life, right? I'm a father and I'm a business owner. And sometimes you have to make the best out of a bad situation in business. You have to fire people. You have to hire people. You have to make decisions that feel crappy. They don't feel like the right decision, but they're the best out of a crappy situation. And so I think that's huge there. So now we move forward into, you know, the, the benefit of being able to make a lot of friends. I'm, I am more or less like you in the way that I moved around quite a bit, maybe not as young in my formative years, but I still have had moved around. And I love the fact that I was able to make new friends often. And I think that's one of the things that probably contributes most to my success in life is my ability to do that. And even though it's uncomfortable, I'm a super introvert. I don't actually like the process of making new friends. 
Okay, it's super annoying and like, why do I have to go make new friends? But I value it to such a high degree that I actually moved my family from Utah to Arizona so that they could go through that process of learning how to make new friends. So now I'm imposing the moving on my family so that they can go through this exact skill that Keaton didn't know he was learning and how valuable it would be in his future life. He was learning at a young age. So talk more about that and how you felt about it in the moment that you always had to make new friends versus how you feel about it now and realizing how it benefits you in business. Hmm. Yeah. So I did not like it at the time. Right. I like hated it. The fact that I had to like leave my friends behind. Right. Um, and it was freaky going to a new place, no one knowing you and everyone knows everyone else, right? Back then, that's what my thought process was. And it was scary and made me probably have anxiety and stress. And I didn't know what those were probably at the time. But I mean, looking back on it and all the people I did meet along the way and being in different places in the country, I think was a a benefit to see how people live differently in different areas, right? On top of the fact that I get to meet meet new friends. And you learn how to adapt and respond. And it seems like the wrong thing, but I I don't think it's okay. Like, 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 I mean, what I mean is I can get people to like me very easily. Is what I find. I think I'm a very likable person, and I, I've, been, I'm, I've been told that, like, man, I've come across on the podcast, but come hang out with me. You'll have a good time. It's right? coming across, bro. You're fun. You know what I'm saying? But, like, it, it that's probably the best thing. I'm, I, I become very likable, and it might be because I'm, like, pandering to who I'm in front of, but I'm not sure that that's such a bad thing. I think it's okay to know your audience type of thing. Sure. And, I, it's it's how I respond on like you know, but what's wild? I've never marketed my business. I've I've grown through referral to fifty to one hundred grand a month. Right. I mean, you marketed it with uh, twenty seven dollars and some flyers, right? But that was it. That, that's it. And, and I think that's a crucial thing. Is there's two aspects of this. You are not necessary and quote on. I'm, I'm going to maybe correct the statement, but I understand how you're saying it. So I don't want to distract from what you said, but, or, and not, but, and you're marketing your business by doing phenomenal for your clients. Yes. And the more you market for your clients, the more they, their success is, that is your marketing strategy is doing really good. Yeah. Some people's marketing strategy, McDonald's, they, they gave up on the doing really good at, providing a good hamburger, they said, I don't care. My marketing strategy is to be omnipresent and to produce at a low cost. Okay. So what somebody's marketing strategy is, is up to them. Your marketing strategy, I would say is invest all those marketing dollars, all the things you could do into being so good that people can't help but talk about you. Yes. Okay. But what's interesting is this skill of getting to learning to be a chameleon to a degree, not in a malicious way, not in a shady way, which some people might think of that, but the right. ability to relate and read people well, that helps on both sides of his business. One, it helps you better relate, well, read and understand who the client is you're trying to help and who they are because you can read them well and their business and understand them on a more personal level, but also how to recognize hey, the, the ideal client This is what they're looking for. So you can then market to them better because you're using your likability and your knowledge of how to be likable to infuse that into these other people's brands. Because it doesn't matter how good your brand is. If your brand isn't likable and people don't want to interact with it, you're not going to get much business. So you need somebody who's doing it. I'll share another person uh, on my podcast. I forget which episode it was, but he had the craziest stutter. He still does. He has a very strong stutter. But he took his stutter and he went into copywriting for for advertisements. I was like, well, how did that help you? He's like, well, my stutter was a gift because the problem that copywriters have is how many different ways can you say the same thing, right? Well, somebody with a stutter, that is the essence of their life. 
They're trying to say something and their mind is going through a thousand different ways to say the same thing because the thing they're trying to say isn't coming out the way a normal person would say it. Hmm. And so like his gift is that he stutters his gift. The things that make him super, super phenomenal at copywriting is the fact that his mind stutters. It forces him to think of other ways to create something. Hmm. Very cool. Okay. And so to a degree, you have a similar gift where you were given the gift of learning how to read and become likable. And now you can employ what seems like the darkest, the biggest liability, the thing you don't want to talk about that you were always moved around and all this stuff. It becomes the biggest asset in your life and business. And that, that's the principle I want to draw out for anybody listening. The things that you are so scared that somebody might find out about you, the things that you're worried about, Hey, I was driving around smoking weed, whatever. That, that ability, that chameleon ability, or in, in, in his case, but it could be anything, your things that you're, ah, it sounds bad to say this about myself, those things are actually the things that can contribute the most to your success if you learn how to use them for the benefit and blessing of the lives of others. If you maliciously use them, it might be your downfall, but if you use them to bless the lives of others, I believe they can be your biggest asset. So the next thing that I want to focus on here is, you know, fifth grade. Uh, maybe it's fifth grade. You move to this new place that I don't remember the, I didn't know how to spell it. So I didn't write it down. Okay. But you get to this music program. I think that's another instrumental part. Of, if you're listening to this, who have you been around that was a winning culture? Being around a winning culture is important at some point. Being exposed to a winning culture is important. It doesn't matter what it is, but being exposed to that. So go into a little bit more detail there about how having that early culture of winning maybe shifted your perspective on your childhood and made you grateful for where you ended up rather than, oh, this sucks. Why did I have to move again? Shifting your perspective to, you know what? I wouldn't have been part of this winning culture if I didn't have to move again. Oh, big time. Big, big time. I mean, it sounds so weird coming from music, but God, we practice like a motherfucker. Like we... I don't know if I can swear on here. Sorry, but like, what it is, we did it now. It's fine. Sorry, guys. <laughs> it's, it's the explicit thing. Um, yeah. So we practice so much, so 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 much. We like we come in at six thirty a.m. in the morning before school started. Practice for an hour, Monday through Friday. On Tuesdays, we'd stay from two two o'clock until three forty-five. And Thursdays, we come in from 5 to 7. And then about every so often, we do a weekend where we do 12 hours on Saturday and 12 hours on Sunday. And then we also had music and band classes throughout our school day. It was a lot. But, like, we were, we were like, the best as well. Like, we, we were high schoolers that sound like professional musicians. Um and it was a lot of fun and it was cool because it was a big band it was a jazz big band so there was like 17 of us like it was like a team and then we were like giving people crap when they couldn't play their their music right you know because that's what good teammates teammates do you know but we helped them along too but i mean we'd also be like come on man you're holding us back so, um, so talk talk about that in, in in the conversation of high standards um you saw this team who had a high standard, high expectation because they were good, right? So you saw them winning, and as a result of winning, you wanted to be part of it. And it was the high standards was okay because they were winning at a high level. If they had those high of standards, practicing 12 hours a day, but they never won anything, would you have still wanted to be part of it? Probably not, no. No, no. so a hard, a good work ethic, all that stuff, and losing – is not like nobody wants to be part of that. And so again, this is part of a family. This is part of a business. This is part of a religion. It doesn't matter what area of your life you need to be winning. Hey, winning is important. Okay? Yeah. It's not everything. It's not everything. But if you aren't winning, people aren't going to want to join you. And winning looks different in every area, right? Winning doesn't mean you get the, the golden thing. Winning could be nobody knows who I am, but my family loves me, right? That could be winning. Okay, so winning is different, but with these high standards, did you ever feel like it was too much? To be honest, no. 
That's good. So why, what, what do you feel like yeah. it was when you were doing it, when you were there for 12 hours and waking up early and staying late? How'd you feel about that? Your it's one word. It's one word. It's passion, right? If you have passion for something and you actually enjoy it down to like your soul, it, like, it doesn't feel like work. Not one second of it feels like work. Is it hard? Is it difficult sometimes? Is it, are you tired? Yeah. But none of it felt like work. Did, did you get to, I, I've been in music and in my experience, music teachers are among the most cutting, criti- criti- <laughs> criticistic people. I know, I don't know if that's a word, but they love to critique and like cuttingly. It's not like, hey, maybe do this better. It's like, Without swearing, because most of them don't swear. <laughs> my, oh, my, swore. <laughs> most, most of my music teachers, they didn't swear. But man, they would dig. It wasn't like, hey, you need to do this better. It's like, hey, why did you miss that 16th of a note, you dumb person? Like, you can do better. And they, they were cutting about it. And it was like, if you're not going to do this, get out of my classroom right now. There's no fair <laughs> It's like, if you're going to play around today, oh, you were... You were caught whispering to your neighbor for 20 seconds or five seconds, or you looked away from me while we were singing. If you got something else better to do, get out of my class. Like they were harsh music. I think they're among the harshest coaches I've ever known in my life as music teachers. (laughs) So how did you think that like that really harsh criticism? And I say criticism, I don't know if that's the right word, but they were building you to be a a, a professional really. How do you think ex- being exposed to that type of harsh feedback helped you when it did come down to the other people in your life who are saying, hey, you can't do this. You're going to fail. Why are you wasting your time? Um, because you got both, right? You got the people who believed in you, but you also have the people who are like, why don't you just be a waiter and earn 50 grand a year and some benefits, right? I love mm-hmm. you. Don't risk it. You know, <laughs> just go. Yeah, but I had a bunch of those for sure. Yeah. You know, you have a wife, you got a kid that you have to take care of, and they obviously want you to at least keep providing food. So why are you doing this business venture that you're going to fail again? We just failed at real estate. We just yes. failed at all these other business ventures. What makes you think you're going to win now? Just go provide for us. Even if it's crappy, we want to survive. Okay. Like it's not there. They're not trying to hurt you by giving you this criticism. They're trying to survive. They're responding in fear. But how did that music training contribute to your success later in life? I've never thought about it before. This is, you're like opening my eyes to things right now. I've never thought, yeah, never thought about that before. But I, I always thought I just wanted to prove them wrong, you know, and I use it as motivation, right? Which I guess that's what happens when you get criticized, right? Like this happens with salespeople a lot, like car salesmen. I know car salespeople will pay thousands of dollars to go to seminars to get yelled at for hours about how bad they suck at their job. Because then they go they go back and they crush it. Right? So it's probably the same thing. Whenever he said like, you know, you tearing to me about playing wrong notes or playing the wrong chord, well like what's wrong with you? And I uh I came back and I knew my part. I memorized it. I can play it with my eyes closed. and Yeah, so it, it works. Uh, I never, ever, ever thought about that before, about the relationship. Yeah, interesting. I, I think it's, it, it's interesting because on the other side, I really like to – this is a – I was just talking to a friend there at my house, and they're like, wow, you don't care what anybody thinks about you. I'm like, no, I care a lot, you know, like so much that I don't like, I don't like being criticized. And I know that most other people, they're too scared to confront me because that's humans. And I don't like confrontation. They don't like confrontation. So if I'm the first to say my piece, then most people won't rebuttal me because they're not certain enough about their their mindset to rebuttal me. So my solution against co- confrontation is to be more vocal than anybody else. <laughs> but none of us like crit- criticism. None of us like c- critiquing or, or confrontation. But I think that in those moments when we are we've had so much of it then we we understand it now the question is how do you feel about being that person for the next person you're working in social media advertising you're working you're managing 20 people and getting your thing wrong you're ultimately responsible for it they can't misspell your crap they can't have the wrong picture 
you don't want to get sued for copyright infringement. Like, so they can't screw it up. And you have to be the person, the big bad monster that you didn't necessarily like when it happened to you, but it helped you. How do you like square that and then go be that person, even though you like to be liked? We all like to be liked. Okay, I think that's a natural human thing. We like to be liked and we like to fit in, but sometimes we have to be harsher because that's what the, we need to do, even though it may take us out of the liked category. During that two days when you're practicing your butt off and you're swearing at your, your choir teacher or whatever, but then when you go win, you're like, oh man, I'm so grateful you never, you never gave up on me and you believed in me. Like, There's always a time for appreciation, but in the moment, sometimes I found it really hard to be corrected. And I don't want to be the jerk to the next person. But also, I know that when, they, when those people were that way to me, I improved. So it's like this catch-22. Am I willing to do for somebody else what somebody did for me, even if it makes me look like a bad guy for a short time? Hmm. Yeah, so I was getting on a plane last Friday, and we had a little team huddle, and I popped on my meeting and we they didn't have the stuff done that they should have had done and i didn't even care that it didn't get done i asked them why so i had to know why so we could fix it and no one had an answer and i go come on guys (laughs) this can't happen you know and I came in on you know Tuesday when I was done traveling, came back, and they had like the most beautiful plan laid out, so it never happened again. Um, and it was like almost brought a tear to my eye. It was so beautiful how perfect this system was. I was like, gosh, thank you. Um, but I don't know if I'm like I'm actually like a really really positive type of dude. I like love to give uh, positive reinforcement. I love to give positive feedback. I love to cheer people on and tell them how amazing of a job they're doing. I find that that motivates and keeps the morale in the office a lot higher. But when I react that way and I say, come on guys, they, you know, when you're like, your parents are disappointed in you. I don't do this on purpose, like, but I, this is what happens. It's worse than them being mad. It's worse than them yelling at you. And they're just like, oh, I let Keaton down. I let the company down. And then they go and they work hard to get it right. It's the same thing when you're you're the one person in the band and you don't know your part. And you're like, come on. You're the one person stopping us from greatness. Yeah, and you feel like this small when you get that. You're like, oh, I'm the one that's failing. And there's nobody else. You can't look at anybody else. You just have to like accept it. And say, okay, I will do better. <laughs> yeah. That's all you can do. Oh, man, we are out of time. This is terrible. But I have so much more I want to talk to you about. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, if you guys are getting tons of value from this, you guys need to go reach out to Keaton. Obviously, you can see who he is at his core and his commitment to being the best thing for you and helping your business get the branding and, and the, the social media marketing. So if you guys are like toying with the idea of social media marketing, not sure where to go, not sure who to ask, not sure if it's going to work or not work, just reach out to them and find out how do they find you if they wanted to maybe go that direction, have their business being marketed through social media, how would they get in touch with you? Yeah, so you can definitely get to me personally in my DMs on Instagram. So it's at the Keaton Nelson show. And I will respond to you personally on there. Just make sure you, you follow me. If I don't respond to you, hit, hit, get a comment so you can get out of the request and I'll follow you back. Um, and I will respond to you one on one. It just might take me a little time to get back to you. But if you really, if you're like looking to work with us, and you, and hey, you want- just, just, I know that's just blew over, but this is a skill that not everybody understands. So just re- explain what you just said about. Uh, if you send me, you're in a request. Most people don't know what a request is on so, on Instagram. And what's the process of getting out of the request feed into a different feed? If somebody, because this this is like he just said this blew over. Like everybody knows it. Most people don't know this, and this could change your effectiveness of leveling up and connecting with people who are farther along to, in the journey, whether in any area of life. How to how to actually get to the person 
is huge. And Instagram has created like gatekeeper rules inside of their algorithms. <laughs> and so how do you get past the gatekeeper of Instagram requests? Yeah. So first of all, go follow. This is the, the our secret formula. It's really, really easy. Follow the person you want to talk to, like about three of their photos and see, send them a DM. If they don't respond, go back and comment and say, Hey, I sent you a DM. I love your content. I want to chat with you. If you can say why you want to chat with me in the, in the comment, that's even better. Like if you got a business proposal or I want to work with you, I want to hire your, your company. It's a lot easier for me to be like, okay, perfect. Then what happens is I go into my DMS and see that you're not there. And I go to my requests and then I'll be like looking for your name. Cause there'll be a bunch of other people in there. Right. So a comment and a like, a like is like, especially if you have a decent social media game going down on Instagram, you're getting lots of likes and you're probably not like going in and checking everybody's profile. But when you comment on a post, it goes into their notifications, not their inbox. And so when you comment and have a conversation with them in their, in their comments, they get notified of a comment. Another way that I've found uh, fairly effective is if you, uh, what's it called? What's it called? When you respond to their, their, uh, story, oh, the story. Yeah, yeah. You can respond to their story and you can tag them in a story and it will generally not show up in requests. It'll show up in, Hey, you've been mentioned in this and it goes into the right feed. So anyways, those are just little things that if you're struggling to get a hold of your person that you're, you're trying to reach out to, that has no, re- they don't know who you are. They have no reason to necessarily know who you are yet. There's ways to get in front of them and get access to them. If you make yourself a value to them. And that's not like a, that these people only care about who is bringing them value. The Instagram algorithm doesn't care about you unless you're bringing value. Okay. Like it's not, it's not that they don't like you or that they're ignoring you. You haven't learned the skills to be valuable to them. Okay. Like, it's yeah. not they're, people are they're busy not. too. Like, yeah, people are busy. Busy. <laughs> like so I need something to catch my eye. Otherwise yeah. I won't I won't go looking for it. Anyway, so get get you in Instagram uh DMs and, and then that's the best way to get a hold of you. Yeah, one on one you'll get me that way. If you want to work with me, you should send me an email at Keaton at PM Marketing as in perpetual motion, PM Marketing dot co not dot com dot co so and then my my assistant will respond to you and we'll get something booked on my calendar to talk so awesome i freaking love it we did not get to everything today that's okay um we'll have to have him on again uh but it, it's just this stuff is so cool and now you get to know Keaton. and he's awesome um from when, when i met him on his podcast i was like you know what this guy he needs a shout out and i just want to interview him because it's there's more to depth to who he is than what he gets to on on his podcast because he's busy interviewing other people. So uh, super, super appreciate that. Where What is your podcast name and how would they find that? It's the Keaton Nelson Show. Yeah, so you should check that out. Definitely check out Sam's episode. I wish I could tell you when it's being dropped. I would say sometime in September, if I had to guess. I'd say late September, uh, mid mid to late September. My My team handles that. If you send me a DM or an email, I can let you know when. Sure. Right? Well, just go, just go subscribe to his podcast, and then when it pops up, you'll get to listen to it. Yeah, subscribe. We got some awesome guests. Dude, Sam was on there. There's, there's a whole bunch of awesome awesome people on there. Um, yeah, really. It's it's going to keep getting better and better with the guests that are coming on there, too. And we're going to have Sam back on, too, because we need to talk more. It's like we need to talk more. But, yeah, man. Sure. Cool. I love it. Hey, we'll catch you guys next time on the Fuel Your Legacy show. If you guys get the opportunity, please rank this. Like, Go in and say five stars, leave a comment, and, and leave a review. That just helps more people see this show and get access to the same content. You can also share this and just send it directly to them. Say, hey, you need to listen to this guy, Keaton and Sam. Why not? Send, send, them, send us both of them. Um, anyways, love your, your support, and we'll talk to you soon. Catch you later on the Fuel Your Legacy show. Thanks for joining us. If what you heard today resonates with you, please like, comment, and share on social media. Tag me. And if you do give me a shout out, I'll give you a shout out on the next episode. Thanks to all of those who've left a review. It helps spread the message of what it takes to build a legacy that lasts. And we'll catch you next time on Fuel Your Legacy. Legacy.